I think I'm ready. All right. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending my talk. Uh, my name is Tim Henderson, and I'm going to be talking to you about managing infrastructure with Python, Fabric, and Ansible. And this is going to be three-part short talk. It's only 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, so it's going to be first part is a little bit of like philosophy, theory, and then code. So we'll just see how long it takes. OK. One person alone. Do the many keyboards make the work light in the dead of the night? How the flickers of the tubes shine so bright. Two hands, ten fingers, typing so swift on keys mechanical. You can hear them click. One machine, then another fixed, the backlog clean. Now it is June, the evening star in the sky. The sysadmin feels the breeze as the seagulls fly by. Back in the office are the keyboards lonely. A customer wonders, why do my pages load slowly? The flickering screens cannot keep pace with the whirring fans. The blades spin as the AC hums. The metal racks gleam, the floor it glows. But not enough, not enough dollars for too few cents. Per page view is made. Where is the sysadmin? They left last May. None to replace them, for we couldn't pay. <laughs> the humble programmer, one keyboard, one screen, no rituals on approach, no doors to knock, just expensive headphones buzzing with static. In the fields of desks by window so small sits the humble programmer, trying to stay away from it all. But alas, the servers are down. Sysadmins, none to be found. To the command line, nay, it is to Ansible we pray. Provision, config, deploy the chant doth resound. So everybody, the world is changing. No longer do we have sysadmins sitting in caves in the understories of our office complexes. Now they are up in our open floor plans. And if they still call themselves sysadmins, they're embedded among the rest of the programmers on feature teams. Or perhaps we don't even have people who call themselves sysadmins. Uh, maybe they call themselves ops people, or maybe they just call themselves programmers or site reliability engineers. And really, what they are doing is they are defining their infrastructure not with plugging cables into computers and trying to figure out how to space things in racks. Of course, there are people who do that. But they're not at most companies anymore. No longer are people like logging in to individual machines and typing commands in and setting up the various services. Ah, no, it's all done programmatically. And operations have become really a programming problem at many different organizations around the world today. And because of this, I think it's really become a programmer's delight. Um, you know, server management should be simple. It should be well documented. It should be repeatable. It should be testable. It should be audible. And all of this is made possible when it stops being around managing machines and starts being around trying to define your infrastructure really in a textual form that you can review, audit, control changes, and so forth. So part one. So how do we get there? Well, I have a three-step process, which will work for anybody, I think, which is step zero, just don't type SSH machine <laughs> and expect that you know, you're going to be able to start typing commands. That's just throw that out the window. Don't do that again. Um, if you do that, you're going to be having difficulties keeping all of your servers in sync. 
it's going to be hard to audit, and it's going to be hard to know exactly what the state of each server is. Because if you have five people, and they all have SSH access, and they just log into machines, and they make changes, do we know what's going on in that machine, or who did what? I mean, maybe we could look at the auth log, but it's going to take us a while to figure it out. Um, much better to just keep that, all that information about what's being changed in a central place. So really, last resort, when everything is on fire, then log into the machine. So step one, use a tool instead. Um, it makes it easy to review changes, um, makes it so that server state is always known, and that you can simply look at what it's supposed to be and have like a reasonable assurance that that is true. And the final step is really standardize all processes across the organization. So from turning on servers and shutting them down to bringing up a new network service, have a standardized process for everything. So, oops. Ah. Well, I'm missing a slide, but that's okay. Um, so, some definitions. So here is you. You are the witch or wizard of the command line. Here are your pizza boxes of servers, and here is your programs, which I'm using this little control flow graph because it's kind of hard to represent a program in an icon. And you are sitting on your laptop, and you are controlling your servers, um, <laughs> each one of them individually. However, that becomes difficult to scale, as I said, if you just log in and type on them. Because what you're trying to set up is an application service that looks like something like this, which is the traditional three-tier architecture. You have your web tier that has Apache or Nginx or something like that running, perhaps load balancer as well, like HA proxy. Then you have your application tier. Here we would have Gunnicorn or UWSGI terminating the Nginx or Apache connection that then communicates to your application, perhaps over, say, fast CGI or another protocol. And then the application then, then talk to your database tier. However, this is kind of naive for today's model. Today we really have multiple of these running in any even small organization. Sometimes we could have three, sometimes we could have 50. We also are probably calling out to multiple external services that are not on this diagram and job queues and all kinds of other things. So we really have classes of machines. We have applications that are supposed to be running on those different classes, potentially multiple. And we have to figure out how to wire them all together. So you are trying to set up individual network services on individual servers. But you can't think locally just about what the needs of that particular server and application are. You really have to think about the whole thing as a unit and how it connects to everything else. Otherwise, the trying to scale setting up all the different hosts is just going to get into spaghetti code. So if we set up everything centrally, we can solve that problem. And if we keep everything on the same sort of life cycle, here is an example life cycle that I like to use. It is not the only one. I think it really helps simplify things. And if you are in the situation where you're like, all of that sounds really good, um, but my organization is just isn't there. We have like some like old database machines, like those are always hand configured. You know, that's okay. Or we're using this old tool, it's not really scaling anymore, but you know, nobody really knows how it works anymore. It's okay. You get there like one little bit at a time. Instead of trying to be like, we're going to redo all of the operations for the entire company right now, and we're going to do it all at once, break it off small pieces at a time, and experiment in the margins on non-critical things. If you try and like do it all on the main bread and butter network service, I think that that is a, um, not an effective way to try and affect change in your organization. So. Uh, enough philosophizing. I really came here to show you code. So we have the hackers in front of their Gibson, if you're not familiar. OK, so Python is blessed with a whole bunch of different tools in this space. 
And so I'm going to talk about two of them quickly because it is a short talk. And I, I believe we have somebody else later today who is talking about some of the other systems out there. So Fabric is a very simple tool to run commands on machines, basically. You can specify which commands to run in a Python file as functions. And so here is a complete setup to set up a Fabric file that will run a simple command to echo out who the user is that connected to the machine. So the main metaphor behind Fabric is defining commands as functions, and then in those functions, saying through their Fabric API what shell commands to run. So it's really about running commands on machines. And it's easy to do. You just make the directory, go ahead and create a virtual environment, install Fabric, type whatever you're going to type as your commands, and then you just run it um, using this command right here called fab. You can also use it as a library and integrate it into larger scripts, which is how I use it. And of course, you can integrate your lifecycle, so for instance, the provision config deploy system, directly into Fabric like this. However, I think that you can get the sense, just looking at this, that it is simple, but it's a little brittle. If one of those commands fails, how exactly is it going to respond? If it fails on one server, Fabric will start failing the whole process on all of them. Um, you can solve all of these problems in Fabric, and it gives you a rich API to do so. And you can really create some really complex systems. But it's a little bit brittle, and you have to um, spend a lot of time to accomplish simple things sometimes. So I also like to use Ansible, which is a higher level tool. So I, have, I sort of use both in a lot of my operation systems. So Ansible, at the simplest level, is a little bit similar to Fabric, you, except that you define a separate file called your host file or your inventory file. This can also be dis, um, provided dynamically um, through, say, the AWS interface, which is how I've often used it. Um, so you describe what computers are available in your host file and what their roles that they're playing are. And then you um, create what are called playbook files. So this one is exactly what we had in Fabric. So it's really not providing us anything yet. And you can run it. And when you run it, it looks something like this. But it is really just so far a complicated SSH. And what makes Ansible better and higher level is that you have modules that wrap up common functionality and make the running of that functionality a lot more robust. You have roles, which lets you split up Things like this is installing and configuring my application. This is installing and configuring Nginx. This is installing and configuring Zookeeper. All those different things into different things called roles. And then, which are, if you're familiar with Chef, are equivalent to their cookbooks. Um, and finally, you have, like Chef and other operation systems, you have templates, which really let you centralize configuration information and also share them between different roles and files. So for instance, here's a motivating module. Instead of just using the git command to check things out, you can use this git task to check things out. And it's going to make it a lot more stable and predictable in what it, and how it's going to work. For instance, the command that I had in the fabric um, fab file, I just said git pull, which if there had been a rebase or something else that occurred upstream, um, could potentially fail, and then your application would not, in fact, get upgraded. So this will um, perform that Git operation much more robustly. So roles are what is going to add structure to your system. So in this directory tree, you basically have your host file or your inventory file. You have your playbook. And then you have a directory of roles. And each one of those roles is going to have inner directories as well. And 
the main entry point to each one of these roles is going to be the task subdirectory. So the roles are really made up of the in these specified structures, and then there's a subdirectory inside of each one called tasks. And tasks.main is the execution entry point. And if you want to configure a lifecycle, you can do that with using the include statement and having a mode variable. Then in your upper level playbook, you can create a provision playbook, set the mode when you include this role, and it will set that mode there and import the provision tasks into your current execution. So you can create these files for each um, life cycle that you have and really capture the whole system like this. And I know that I'm running short on time, so I think I'm going to wrap up here and not discuss doing configuration with templating, which really works very similarly to doing HTML templates. This example um, is writing out uh, a piece of the HDFS slash Hadoop config. So we're going to stop here. Um, I want to give you a couple of takeaways. Um, the first is the high level takeaways, which are developers are increasingly performing operational roles, and that operations folks are increasingly performing developer roles. So they're really kind of merging together in many ways. And operations is looking more and more like programming than it ever did before. So the practical thing is don't run commands on servers, use a tool, and follow a standardized process for everything. The, tool to the two tools I demoed here are just some examples that could get you started. And I think we have a talk later today where somebody's going to go through a deeper example and a longer talk. So if you're interested, I would recommend that you attend that. OK, and here are some resources that you can look at when you um, are trying to find something about it, and I'm hoping that the slides will get posted. Okay. Okay, questions. We have two.